Hello, my name is Tom Hutchins. I'm the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing with Angel Oak Mortgage Solutions. We are a non-agency wholesale and correspondent lender based out of Atlanta, Georgia, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, I first wanted to start by talking about uh, the opportunity in the market uh, as Angel Oak sees it, and we, we can start with looking at what has happened in the agency and non-agency world over the last 14 or 15 years. Uh, what you're seeing on your screen is our graphs of uh, securitization issuance over that period of time. And I just wanted to point out, uh, as many of, uh, of the listeners know, that non-agency has always been a, a very significant part of the mortgage market. And in fact, you can see from an origination standpoint and also a securitization standpoint, in the mid-2000s, prior to what we all know as, as the, the crash in the real estate market, uh, non-agency issuance exceeded uh, conforming issuance, issuance. So what that means is there were more loans that fell outside of the government loans than there were that fell inside the government loans. Um, and in fact, uh, that, that number was in the uh, two trillion mark for in 2005 and 2006. Uh, then you can obviously see that after 2007 and, and the crash that we're all aware of, uh, non-agency issuance uh, virtually disappeared to you know, a couple hundred billion a year. And those that have been in the business long enough know that that has been primarily, if not almost entirely, uh, jumbo issuance. So A paper, A plus paper, jumbo loan securitizations has really been the only non-agency securitizations that have taken place in the market uh, since 07. So that is the opportunity that Angel Oak believes uh, we can help you uh, satisfy by taking care of and finding those borrowers. Another logical conclusion is that after this crash, uh, that there, we can't imagine that there are fewer uh, borrowers in, in the country that would not fall out of non-agency guidelines compared to how many did prior to the crash. Then specifically within non-agency is subprime. So subprime issuance uh, was also fairly significant. When, when non-agency was $2 trillion, subprime was at its peak over $600 billion annually. And you can see in its peak of 05 and 06, then 07 came, and since 07, it has virtually disappeared. So subprime issuance has gone away, and again, back to what I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we believe uh, quite strongly that those borrowers haven't gone away. Unfortunately, just the loan programs available to those borrowers are what's gone away. Uh, a very important thing to understand is the difference in today's subprime versus the peak subprime, the 05 and 06 uh, market, as I just showed you on those, those graphs. There are very significant differences from a guideline standpoint, and, and I'll just go through them. Primarily, uh, the, the first few are, are the, the biggest. First is that in the peak of subprime issuance, uh, no money down was the, the standard loan. They were, that was done through 80-20 combos or just straight 100% financing. Uh, also at that time, credit scores averaged in the high 500s. Um, you, you put on top of that, income was, was very suspect. There was alt doc, there was no doc. Uh, everyone remembers the NINA loans, no income, no asset. Um, W-2 stated, so people that, that had a, a W-2 job were, their income was not being verified. It was just being stated on, on their application and that was good enough and that's what lenders used to make loans. Uh, reserves were not required. Uh, DTIs, really lenders only looked at a, a back-end DTI, uh, and 50 was, was the norm, and you know, some lenders exceeded that to 55 and higher. Uh, there were lots of creative products. Uh, interest only. Interest only is a, is a terrific loan. A lot of people believe in that loan, but it's for the right borrower, for the borrower who knows how to manage 
his or her money, not for not for every single borrower, but interest only kind of took on a life of its own and became rampant uh, throughout the space. Uh, NEG-AM, the, also called the pick-a-pay loan, uh, that, that works whenever real estate values go up. But again, that, that product was really never created for the general public, although that's who started getting those kinds of loans. And then you know, the, the volume, a $600 billion a year uh, market at its peak in the 05, 06 range. So now fast forward to 2015, remembering from the earlier chart, there's been zero origination of these loans since the crash in 07. Um, and those that have been in the business that long know there's been zero originations of those loans. So Angel Oak, we, we got into this market almost two years ago. And what I'd like to do now is just kind of educate you on what subprime looks like today. The word subprime is still being used. It's also called non-prime. Uh, but, but let me give you kind of a differentiation between the two. Uh, the non-prime, subprime of, of 2015 requires down payments. Uh, we really believe strongly that these loans will perf perform because borrowers have what we call skin in the game. Uh, in addition to them having to make the down payments, we find out the source of those down payments. So we feel very confident that does not mean that they, they can't get gifts, gift funds and fam, you know, uh, money and down payment money from, from family, but we need to know that's where that money came from. So a lot of the things that, that went on in the past had to do with lack of seasoning of any funds if there were any funds in a transaction. Uh, the other thing uh, that's interesting about our current production is the average FICO for our subprime productions slash non-prime is in the mid to upper 600 range, uh, right, right around 680. So um, we, are, we are talking about a really different borrower. The other piece we're going to talk more about, about it today is, is ability to repay. ATR is a huge factor, and ATR applies to every owner-occupied and second home transaction uh, in the United States. So. Um, just because a borrower is, is looked at in a, in a subprime type of loan, they do not qualify for, for an agency loan, does not mean that the ability to repay does not come into play. Uh, rates, put that on there just as a range, because what is happening is uh, when we go back to the, those issuance slides, issuance means securitizations, which means private equity. How much private capital is coming into the mortgage market to purchase these loans? Well, the only way to get purchase purchasers into this market is for them to, they're obviously going to be willing to take on additional risk, but for them to take on that additional risk, they need to be compensated through it with a higher rate of return. So that's, you know, the 4% the conforming rates do not apply in a non-prime environment. So rates today are in the 5 to 9% range, and it basically is based on the borrower and their uh, their quality. Reserves are required. Uh, we look at borrowers, not only their ability to repay, but do they have money in the, the bank to pay the mortgage in case something happens to their ability to repay. Uh, DTI, 35-43, that's, that's kind of a standard and really what I'd point out is not necessarily the 43, but the 35. 35 front end ratio is very important. A lot of people who are not familiar with the new subprime ask us why that matters. And it's a very easy explanation. If a borrower has, let's say, a 45% back-end ratio, and uh, excuse me, front-end ratio, so their housing debt is 45% of their gross income, if they have any type of hiccup, it's going to be very, they, they don't have any really wiggle room to maybe uh, not pay some other debts, but if they have a, let's say the borrower that has a 25 front-end ratio and a 50% back-end ratio, there's a lot of room in their, their debt load before they, they have to actually get to their mortgage payment. And of course, we're in the mortgage business, we're lending on their primary residence, we believe that's going to be a borrower's priority, so if they have wiggle, wiggle room in there, basically by having a lower front-end ratio, then we believe their ability to repay is further enhanced. 
the other piece um, that that is really different and based on some of the regulation is uh, is what what is known as AIR appraiser independence requirements and that basically means uh, originators or anyone who is who uh, stands to be compensated in a transaction cannot be involved in the appraisal process, the appraisal ordering or delivering pro delivery process. So the values that we are lending on today are determined by a, a, a very um, unbiased third party. So that's a regulation that has really made a big change and everyone in the market understands the difference that that has made on a day in, day out basis. So that when, an, let's say, a 75% loan to value a loan is given, everyone can be confident it's a 75% loan to value versus back in the heyday, um, you didn't know for sure that whatever loan to value you were lending at was the actual loan to value because there was really very few controls on appraisals and appraisal delivery. And, you know, really the subprime of today is is the volume. It's, it's kind of a big question mark because there are not issuances going on in the subprime market. So uh, anyone in this space is privately held generally, and so uh, compiling that data is, is, is rather difficult. Qualified mortgages and ability to repay. Something I mentioned earlier, but qualified mortgages, QM, came into being in January of 2014, so uh, just under two years ago, and there is a lot of confusion around QM. There's less today than there was in 2014, but there still is some confusion. So I wanted to spend just a few minutes of, of the criteria that has been set forth in the Dodd-Frank Act for a qualified mortgage. And those are prohibits negative amortization. So the NEG-AM loans, the pick-a-pay that I mentioned earlier, those, those would be a non-QM loan. Interest only, the same thing. Any balloon payments, any loan terms greater than 30 years. Uh, prohibits prepayment penalties with li limited exception, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Points and fees, all points and fees uh, charged to a borrower may not exceed 3%. Debt to income, this is kind of where this 3543 that you saw earlier, um, qualified mortgage sets the cap at a 43% debt, debt to income ratio for a loan to be a qualified mortgage. Uh, number eight, and it, it must meet the eight pillars of ATR, which we, are, we will talk about a little bit more. And the other thing is that any loan that's purchased by a, a GSE is assumed to meet the ATR standard. And a lot of that goes to some of the automation and approvals uh, of government loans. They just assume that the standards are met when it comes to ATR because you've, you know, a lender has gotten an approval to, to fund that loan. So, the ATR rule, the ability to repay rule requires lenders to demonstrate they have made a reasonable, good faith determination based on verified and documented information that a consumer has the ability to repay a mortgage loan before extending credit. So the verified and documented information is underlined for a reason. Um, that, that is something that, that's the environment that whether you are originating an agency or a non-agency loan, this applies. Um, all residential loans for a borrower's primary or second home must meet the ability to repay. So there is a misconception that if a borrower is doing a non-QM loan or a non-agency loan, that ability to repay does not apply. That is very far from the truth. Ability to repay must be determined if credit is being extended on someone's owner-occupied or second home. So a primary residence, ability to repay and those standards, which here are the pillars. Uh, pillar number one, current or reasonably expected income or assets. Um, the, the legislation, the regulation does make comment about two years. Keep that in mind. Their current employment status. The monthly payment on the covered transaction. The monthly payment of any simultaneous loans. The monthly payment for, for all mortgage-related obligations. Current debt obliga obligations, alimony and child support. So obviously, you must 
take into account things outside of the loan that they're getting for their primary residence, the monthly debt to income ratio or residual income, and credit history. So ability to repay does include a borrower's past history. So by that by and, and by meeting those eight pillars, uh, ATR loans are provided rebuttable presumption, which we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but there are two levels of of safety, and that's safe harbor and rebuttable presumption. But if if, if ability to repay is met, then a rebuttable presumption at minimum is reached. Uh, this next slide is who is responsible for ATR. Uh, the reason I bring this up, or the reason I believe this is very important, is that we as a lender it is, is the party that the CFPB would consider uh, the creditor, and so we are responsible for determining a borrower's ability to repay on every one of our transactions. And the reason that we bring that up is that we have heard since QM came out and ability to repay and all these regulations, there have been concerns uh, by brokers and lenders alike that they will be held responsible for ability to repay. However, it's very explicit in Regulation Z, and it's, it's identified right here. The party responsible for ATR and Safe Harbor is the creditor. And a creditor is defined as the person who regularly extends consumer credit and to whom the obligation is initially payable. So in our environment, initial payments at the closing table are will be due and payable to Angel Oak Mortgage Solutions. So because of that, we are the ones that are uh, on, on the hook, so to speak, for ability to repay regulation. And again, I think that's just very important for, for everyone to understand the definitions that's given by the CFPB. Qualified mortgages. Um, you know, this is where I think just understanding what is happening, uh, the subprime product back in the day versus today's new issue uh, is extremely different. Um, and the primary difference that I see is down payment. Also, you know, we like to refer to that as skin in the game uh, and ability to repay. Th those two things really change the dynamics and the performance ultimately of these types of loans. Um, so this is why being outside of QM guidance and non-QM loans uh, is, is something that, that Angel Oak is very comfortable with. What are the benefits to the borrower? Uh, I, we get asked quite often, what types of borrowers are, are out there in the market? Because you know ultimately it matters to the lenders for them to uh, find the borrowers and market these products and programs so they can extend and grow their business, especially if we're in a rising rate environment. So, so I just put a few examples. One of the most common borrowers that we see on a regular basis are those that have had a credit event. That credit event, a foreclosure or short sale that has not seasoned as long as what is required through agency loans. So that, that's extremely common. Um, Borrowers that don't have uh, W-2 income, but they use income of, off of their investment properties. Uh, this this kind of gets into some non-owner occupied type transactions. Uh, Self-employed borrowers. Uh, we we actually have a bank statement program where we look at a borrower's cash flow over a period of time and use that as their income, and and that is what we use to document a borrower's ability to repay a loan. There are foreign nationals, lots of foreign nationals buying property in the United States, so that's a great opportunity for originators to, uh, to div div uh, d diversify their product offerings. Uh, and then borrowers that have significant savings but limited income. If you remember back to the eight pillars of ATR, um, it's, it, it's had a key word. It said a borrower's income or assets, so someone who that maybe does not have the monthly income coming in, but does have significant assets in order uh, to, to pay for their mortgage, that is also considered in the ability uh, to repay calculations. Um, the other piece that, that really differentiates what's going on in the non-QM, non-prime space is that uh, we like to say we, we are making our underwriting credit decisions with our eyes wide open. Every single loan in, in our uh, 
uh, in our pipeline must be manually underwritten. Um, so the, the good news about that is that we don't have a computer saying no to loans that makes sense. We are looking at loans, making underwriting credit decisions loan by loan, and by doing that, we're able to give good borrowers who have the ability to repay another chance. Someone who's had that credit event, that life event, as opposed to them being required to remain a renter for X number of years, this allows a borrower to buy that house that they've been wanting to buy. The majority of, of the production that, that we're seeing is, is purchase transactions. So the other thing that I would tell you, we know how to meet closing dates. We understand when you're working in a purchase transaction environment, there are lots of parties involved. There are listing agents, there are sellers, there are buyer's agents, there are obviously buyers and borrowers, there, there's moving trucks, there's all kinds of people involved in our transactions. So if there is a closing date, we are fully committed to meeting those closing dates so the transaction goes smoothly and the originator can, can really shine in front of their referral source and get, get these loans that previously were not available in the market, not only get them done, but get them done on time. So that's it for today's presentation. I really appreciate your time. Please uh, go to our website at angeloakms.com and look us up. Give us a call. We'd love to work with you and show you how we can help you grow your business. Thanks very much for your time.